Okay, it is 8.01 on Tuesday morning. We're gonna get going. Welcome everyone. Uh, this is our virtual summit on equitable primary care in the community on the ground perspectives. Uh, today's summit is actually kicking off a new multi-year healthcare collaboration between Rush University's uh, Graduate College and Illinois Tech's Institute of Design. The collaboration is focused on equitable primary care. And I'm Kim Irwin. I'm a co-director of the Equitable Primary Care Collaboration. I'm also a research professor at Illinois Tech's Institute of Design, which is a graduate program, for those of you who don't know, on the south side of Chicago. I also lead the Institute of Design's Equitable Healthcare Initiative, which is housed in uh, ID's new Action Lab, which is a new platform for engaging corporate partners. Uh, I'm your co-host today. But uh, along with my uh, Rush colleague and co-director, Santosh Basipur. Santosh, why don't you say hi? Hello, everybody. Uh, so glad to have you this morning with us. Um, I'm also an alum of IIT Institute of Design. I got my PhD there. But uh, I'm now a director of design at Rush University, and I work on university strategy and transformation. Um, I'm also an associate, uh, assistant professor at, uh, I wish I was associate, but I'm an assistant professor at uh, Rush uh, Graduate College, and uh, as you might know, we offer a lot of interesting programs in masters in clinical research, masters in biotechnology, uh, with a lot of different tracks. So please check them out. Um, and it is my pleasure, really, to be working with Kim and IIT Institute of Design and co-leading this uh, collaboration and uh, amazing partnership. Um, to to get the things going, uh, I, I'll start with saying that I'm really humbled by the positive response we have gotten so far, and the support has been amazing to get this project off the ground. The focus of our work is uh, essentially twofold, I would say. Uh, Kim, add, uh, add when you feel, uh, if you feel uh, you need to add anything. First is to apply the human-centered systems design thinking to discovery and design of new models of primary care, uh, which are equitable and have the values that we aspire them to have. And more than that, we want these new cares, uh, care models of, uh, of primary care to be in community created settings, community effective uh, models and community valued models. So we are not just making them up and then testing them out there. We want these to be essentially co-created with the community so that the values of the communities are not just informing the design but are effectively addressing the specific wants and needs. And secondly, uh, we aspire to explore and appreciate this complexity that is present in any healthcare design project. And we would like to create the body of knowledge and application of systems thinking and design thinking in this space of primary care. Uh, with that, uh, as uh, thank you, Kim, for the slide, you can see that the agenda is um, very simple. We have an amazing list of people who are going to be uh, giving us their perspective. Introductory remarks are going to be made by Honorable State Senator Matty Hunter. Thank you, Matty Hunter, for taking this time. Uh, panel presentations will happen after that. We have uh, four perspectives, in-home, provider, community, as well as program level uh, perspective. And then we will host uh, two um, rounds of panel discussion and open it up for Q&A after that. Uh, with that, uh, Kim, back to you. You're muted, Kim. Unmute. Thank you. <laughs> we are honored today. I and, know. Um, uh, State Senator Batty Hunter, who's uh, from the third Senate district, which includes Brownsville and uh, Illinois Tech. Uh, Senator Hunter is a longtime champion for improving health access. And so it's fitting that she introduce our panel and our virtual summit today. Without further ado, um, please welcome Senator Batty Hunter. Thank you, Kim and uh, Basapur. Uh, good morning, everyone. As Kim indicated, I'm State Senator Matty Hunter from the 3rd Legislative District, and I'm honored to be here this morning to welcome you um, to Illinois Technology and Rush Virtual Summit on Equitable Primary Care in the Community. Today, we are in for some fruitful discussion uh, from a dynamic panel of experts in community health care about the uh, challenges involved in primary care in Chicago's most at risk um, communities and designing programs that fit um, those community needs. As someone who has advocated for increased access 
for health care for underserved um, communities throughout my legislative career. I am thrilled that such a collaboration is actually taking place, um, informing and inspiring necessary action um, in our communities. Over the past year and a half, we've seen thousands of deaths due to COVID-19, and we've seen how racism has intensified the effects of the pandemic. Um, COVID-19 continues to um, highlight that healthcare is not evenly accessible in our um, city. Our baseline health, our estimated length of life, and our ability to live a high quality productive life, it basically varies uh, dramatically by neighborhood with uh, research suggesting that a um, 16 life expectancy gap between downtown residents and west side residents. And no one is served by this inequity, just simply no one. We know that primary care is essential for better health and equity. However, primary care is under, underutilized by the very people, <clears throat> excuse me, who need it most. Those, this is, um, it, this is a systems design problem, uh, you guys. It's not a population problem. Primary care has been designed um, for those with resources, those who have flexible jobs with the ability to take time off, have a car to get there, but, and have the means and community settings to do what a provider has recommended. Um, community feedback basically, basically tells us um, the system often fails the people who need it most. It is really hard to understand, it's difficult to access, and the care received can feel transactional and impersonal. Community residents have said the, the, the cost benefit ratio of assessing primary care doesn't add up um, for them. Many needs assessments um, have documented barriers, but do we really understand um, what terms such as social determinants of health uh, really mean at a level of, of uh, human experiences. Um, it's time to take action against the factors that, that has led us here. Um, where are the solutions going to come from? The creation of equitable community, effective primary care needs to engage community in the design of these services. This panel of individuals with community level experience will discuss um, how to design primary care that communities understand, trust, and will use. They are here to talk about designing for human experiences in our healthcare system. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome um, an, an awesome uh, panel. We have Kim J, a senior community health worker consultant and trainer at Sinai Urban Health Institute with over 20 years of experience working with West and South Side communities. She will provide an in-home perspective. Next, we have Angela Moss. She's the Assistant Dean of Faculty Practice at Rush University's College of Nursing. She is also Director of Nurse, Director of Rush Nurse Managed, Managed Community Clinics. Angela will give us a provider perspective. And then we'll have Chris Rudd, um, clinical professor of community-driven design at the Illinois Tech Institute of Design. He is also founder of, of Shy by Design, a Chicago-based social and civic impact design firm that shifts community power to community members. Chris will contribute um, a community design perspective. And Leanna Lopez, um, Director of Behavioral Health and Community Programs at Medical Home Network located in downtown Chicago. Leanna will provide a systems level perspective with a focus on innovation programs launched at federally qualified health centers. So I am confident that, that um, the Rush IIT collaboration will make real progress towards equitable, equitable people-centered care 
and I support these vital efforts to make our local, regional, and national healthcare systems more equitable. Health communities are powerful assets. Community, healthy communities benefit everyone, not just those who receive care. Everyone benefits when our population is healthy, businesses, families, and communities. We strive together. Thank you and enjoy the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Hunter. That was a, a very important introduction um, and it really underscores why we need to have more conversations along this line. The health disparities issues in Chicago um, really need to, need to be addressed. Who's gonna do it if we don't? So um, our first panelist, uh, without much further ado, is senior community health worker and trainer, Kim Jay. In the spirit of transparency, Kim and I started working together in 2013 on a grant to improve pediatric asthma care in six emergency departments in Chicago. And um, I uh, deeply respect what Kim does. And she is one of the people who can use her words and put me in a room um, to help understand the human experience of what happens when somebody leaves the emergency department and, and goes back home and tries to improve um, their the health of their child? So uh, without much more introduction, I'm going to turn it over to Kim. Thank you very much, uh, Kim Irwin, and thank you very much, Senator Hunter, for that uh, those amazing introductory words. Uh, they uh, really inspire me in this moment to even tell my story and my experience about working with community as a community health worker. So I'm going to start to share my screen and speak to you from the community health worker perspective and dealing with um, community members in a boots on the ground uh, view. Most times when our patients that we serve come into uh, the clinical care arena, they are coming there because they are sick, yes. Um, sometimes they come to that space when they are in a space of just extreme need and you wonder, why are you here so late in the game? But there's a, there's a story behind that. So it's about connecting, building trust and changing lives. So as we go on, Okay, to the next slide, if it would allow me. Yeah, so um, there we go. When we think about what, why the resistance, uh, especially in the black and brown communities, we think about some of the historical mistrust. We think about the things that our, our parents told us about. Some of us about our own experiences about uh, how uh, people of color were mistreated, how they were disregarded, how their input was not taken into consideration, and how a blatant just disrespect for human life was put in, put in a place of honesty, transparency, and concern. Uh, one of the, we talk about some of the two major events that happened in history, and that was the Tuskegee experiment, where um, the men in the military were given uh, syphilis and were watched what the condition did to their body, how it ravished them. And even when there was a cure, they were not offered the cure. And uh, and the medical arena knew about it. That was a problem. And with Henrietta Lacks using her cells uh, to advance medical uh, advancements, um, and there was no recognition, there was no permission given. And because of these things that happened uh, in our historical past, they made a stamp on how we view the medical system going forward. And most of us, uh, I know with my uh, growing up, my parents were like, no, nah, I'm going to deal with this at home and whatever means necessary. So whatever remedy that they knew from growing up with their parents, that's what they applied to the situation. And that's how we lived our lives. We lived our lives based on our own terms and, uh, and what we felt was best for us because the trust was broken. So when we are in that space and uh, we're going to we're going through our whatever illness that it is, we think about um, some of the things that I've heard uh, in the community. It's like, it, it's gonna be okay. You know, I'm gonna pray about it. God's gonna take care of it. And you know, and you're watching people fall apart in front of your eyes, but they're relying on their faith. They're relying on this spirit of, you know, if I just stay at home and take care of it, I, I'm all right. But if I go to the hospital, something, I'm not gonna come back home. And, 
they take this mindset and they are so comfortable with it. They're, they're, they're tied to it. And you, and from my perspective as a community health worker who's trying to help the community and help change this concept, I am sitting there thinking, oh, what can I do to bring transparency and honesty to this situation so that when people are in need of health care, that when they are in need of services, that they feel confident to seek it out without any repercussions of something negative happening to them in those situations. A lot of our uh, community members and those that um, I serve, they just feel like doctors are untrustworthy. Why? Why go through the process? And uh, because they see that money is the top tier reason why people are shuffled in to hospital care and you're just a dollar sign and nobody really cares about me. So why even put myself in that situation? And it was really disheartening because being working in connection with the hospital, I we always know that there are some bad apples, but the whole bushel is not bad. And we have to sort of uh, change that message and change that tone and try to get our community members not under the auspices of uh, hiding truths, but with transparency to let them know that this is how it goes. This is how we can do this. And I want you to see me as that first avenue of trust. So uh, a lot of my interventions were done in home. And what I would do when I would go into the home, I had to really take off any kind of face of shame or embarrassment because now I'm in somebody's personal space. I'm in a space where they live, where they thrive, where where they interact with their family. So when I'm coming into their home, I'm coming in as friend. I'm coming in as your partner. I'm coming in as your liaison. I'm coming in as your connector. So when I walk in the door and I see what I see, I see what I see and try to do something about those negative things that appear there. I remember one time in going into a home during my first um, home visit, and I was really excited because I was just trained and I was like, oh yeah, this is gonna be great. And I go to this first home visit and I walk into the house and my face could not hide what I was feeling. And as I looked around, I was like, oh my gosh. And I understood why the entire family had asthma. I understood at that moment why the exacerbation was going on, but I also understood that maybe this isn't the right fit for me because I was totally overwhelmed that being a part of the community, that this was really going on just a few houses down from where I lived. And uh, it almost kick me out of the profession, I'll say that. I've been doing it for, for a very long time, but at that time, um, I saw that I was overwhelmed. I went back into the office and I said, no, nah, I can't do this. I had planned in my head after that visit, this is gonna be over. Give my two weeks notice, let me out of here. But uh, one of my colleagues at that time told me, Kim, you know, every house isn't like that. But again, what you saw is the reason why you're needed. And I knew that had to be uh, some change and it had to come through me by any means necessary. So I continued on in this path of connecting and trying to change some things that were happening in the, in the lives that I saw of those who were around me. Um, you know, I, as a community health worker, we think about, you know, why a community health worker? A community health worker, by definition, is somebody who looks like the community, works in the community, has a strong understanding of the struggles, and can connect on a level because you know what? Sometimes we're going through the same challenges as the people that we're trying to connect with. Um, what makes the difference is the time that we spend with the person. And we don't use the high level jargon that explains a condition or uh, that explains how. Uh, the, the medicine is going to work. We put it in a, in a space to say, you know what, uh, this is what uh, this is. We, we talk about uh, hypertension and the, the, the equity and they, the, those words, they're like, what are you talking about? You're, you have high blood pressure. Uh, you're sick. We need to take this medication and explain it to a way what some people can understand. Because very oftentimes when we're going to a home, medication would be sitting there. But because they did not trust the instruction, they weren't taking it. So people were getting sicker. They would go into the emergency departments and they were like, I'm, I'm sick. And they would look at the chart, but you got medicine. Why are you still sick? 
They didn't understand it. So I'm not going to take it. So we go into that with the, with the eyes of saying, you know what, I know there's a disconnect, but let me see where it lies. So when we look uh, at this picture here, um, this is actually a picture from a patient home I went to see. Uh, this patient had asthma and so did her son. And um, one thing we have to remember is that when patients go into a clinic setting or a hospital setting, they're not telling you that they are living like this. They are not telling you that there's mold. They're not telling you, oh, I have rodents. They're not telling you that, oh, my lights are off or I don't have any food. They are just presenting with the condition uh, that brought them there. If it's chest pains, if it's high blood pressure, if it's diabetes, whatever it is. But they're not going to tell you that it's raining in my bathroom and the mold is growing daily. And that's why I'm sick. I went into this home. And uh, again, the, the mom, asthmatic. And I looked at the conditions of the house and I had to go in there and like put the game face on because I didn't want to be a person that brought shame or embarrassment to this to this household. I had to see the person for who they were. And when I saw that, you know, you may see this like, why are you living there? But there's a story behind that. And these are like those social de determinants that we speak of. Um, the story behind this was she was a mother who had uh, six kids and two of her children had children and they had had previous issues with living in a space and being kicked out of a space. And she was afraid that if she made too much noise about these conditions in her home, that she would lose her house again. So my task, uh, first of all, yeah, I'm going to talk to her about the, her condition, but I need to help with the situation as well. So I partnered with one of our organizations, Metropolitan Tennis Organization, to get her some help to get this taken care of. And one of the sad things about this is that the landlord knew this was going on, but he was still collecting $1,100 a month rent from this mom. So, um, again, my job was to yeah, not only deal with the medical side, but to deal with the life side. Because the reason why people are not coming to care is not because they don't want to be obedient to the regimen that, that's been given to them. They're doing it because life is happening and choices have to be made. And sometimes the choice is I have to even forego taking care of myself because my house, my children, my life, the existence that I know it is at, is in, at um, in jeopardy. So choices are made. But uh, being the community health worker that I have been and connecting and partnering with um, our, our patients, we have to do it as a team and not just a, an I agenda. So we think about building trust. You know, we want to we have to really change our approach about how we connect with patients. We want to normalize uh, uncertainty and questions and accepting that feedback, because most times when they come into a clinical setting, they're afraid to ask questions because they feel like I'm not worthy to do that. Who am I to challenge what a physician says or a nurse says? I'm just going to sit here and take what's been said to me and go home and then try to figure it out. Um, we shouldn't let patients leave a space without asking them, you know, tell me in your own words how what you understood me to say. Because one of the biggest disconnects is that what's being told in the clinical setting is to, comes down jumbled when they get home. And as a result, people f try to make up how they take the medicine or how they do the process on their own because they understood something different. I had a patient when I went into the house, part of my process is to ask, show me how you use your medicine. And she was an asthmatic and she took her medicine and she shook it up. I was like, okay, that's part of the process. And then one thing she did, she took a cleansing breath, which most people don't do. That's a deep breath in and an exhale out, which really clears the lungs to get them ready for medication. I was like, okay, this is great. So the next thing she did was the reason why I understood she was still in trouble. She took that medicine and she sprayed it over her shoulder and she breathed the air. And I was like, oh, okay, now I get it. But again, if she were to go into the, the doctor's office and they asked her, are you taking your medicine? She would have absolutely said yes, but it was being done wrong. So 
what we had, what I had to do in that moment was not scold her about that, but to say, you know what, you got some things right. Let me give you some pointers on how to do this better. And with those uh, conversations of just understanding and compassion and empathy and just like, you know what, you don't know what people are going through and applying that to the situation, you are able to build those trusting relationships. And whenever people have a say in how they are treated, you get a better result. So um, it's always important to ask, even though we have an agenda, is this okay? Are you okay with this process? And get the input so we can make sure that what we are doing is applicable to that person's life in their situation. Because even though there's a charter for how we treat people with certain conditions, it does not apply to everyone. And we have to take that into account. There are stories that I can share on uh, an ongoing basis that we can speak to this uh, when we think about what um, what does it take to build those trusting relationships. It takes those collaborative. Uh, collaborations. It takes those connecting with working with doctors in the clinics and um, dealing with diabetes patients. Some of that same collaboration comes into play. The doctor told me, Kim, I don't know what's going on with my patient. She has everything she needs. I need you to go to the house, check it out, see what's happening. This was a diabetes patient. And when I went in, the house was nice. I didn't have any complaints about that. And uh, she show me how she used her medicine. It was okay. A few things we needed to take care of, but there was one thing that was going on that I was shocked to find out. <laughs> she was running a candy store in the house. She's a diabetic patient. She should not be running a candy store or have this access. But in the moment, I'm thinking, oh, I got to get her to get rid of this. But I knew there was a story behind that story. So uh, in speaking to her, I just said, you know what? Why are you doing this in the in the house with the candy she goes well you know what my mom and brother were killed in a car accident and I'm selling this candy to raise money for their tombstone and I was like oh okay I cannot tell her to get rid of this how can I address this situation still building building that trusting relationship respecting and honoring what she's doing but also being concerned about her health I had to ask her okay well what, which part of this is your favorite what do you really really like up here and we identified that particular item. And I asked her, I said, well, would it be okay if we not have this one? And you still do the candy store, but not have this one. And then on the back end, let me see what I can do to help you with this situation regarding the headstones for your mom and your brother. We had this agreement. She gave her input. I gave my input. We agreed on a process and it was able to work for us. And at the end of that, I was able to get uh, her some assistance with getting those tombstones through another federation that helped. I said all this to say that um, change is a collaborative effort. We have to consider the one that we're speaking to in front of us as a part of the process. We come in with some knowledge, but they definitely have an idea about how they want to change, uh, address their life and their condition. So we have to get their feedback. When I think about the community health worker perspective, I think about the way uh, we spend the time. We are the extension of the medical health care system. We're not trying to take over in any way possible, but we are your eyes and ears outside of the four walls of a hospital. We want to be your partner. We reiterate what's being said in clinic. So when they're at home, it absolutely is being followed because oftentimes patients don't remember. And I know that patients are a very important part of the process. They have a right to have a say so and what their care looks like. And once you give them a, an opportunity to have a voice and to feel comfortable within that network of, of mediation or conversation, you'll see that the result will definitely change. Trust is a valuable commodity and it should not be taken lightly. Um, and whenever we are in these interactions, consider the person in front of you as a part of the change, as a part of the answer, as a part of the solution. Um, and with that, I just say thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to speak about it. And um, I hope so much, I was able Jane. to share some information. Okay, thank you. I'll I stop guess. sharing at this time. As you said, thank you so much. As you said, uh, change is the only constant and uh, we need to have 
the, the, the it's not a partnership it's it's like a collaboration that that needs to be there at every step so thank you so much for that uh, we are going to go directly to dr moss uh, angela moss is the director of nurse run community clinics at rush and does incredible work in the community as well so we will uh, ask her to share her provider perspective uh, mm -hmm. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. I'm going to give me just a minute while I pull up my slides and let me make it the presentation view. Okay. Um, Kim, Kim J, I just want to say, just, I want to just reflect for a moment on what you shared. Um, so I've been a provider in the, in the community. I'm a nurse practitioner. I've been a provider in the community for the better part of 20 years. And hearing your perspective, from um, what patients are seeing, what healthcare providers are seeing in the community is exactly what I see as well. So there's a lot of synergy there. So um, thank you for sharing your perspective. Um, I wanna share, I usually start when I talk about what we do in the community and how as a healthcare provider, how we, we approach our community-based care. I like to show this, this little diagram here. And I'll, if you'll indulge me, I'll spend a minute just to talk about it. Um, in a nutshell, what this means, so if we say um, what we wanna do as healthcare providers is we wanna improve health outcomes. And we say that loosely, we define that by improving the length of life. As Senator Hunter mentioned, there is a, a life uh, gap between the west side and downtown. So as a healthcare provider, I'm very motivated to try to fix that. Um, and then also, as Kim outlined, the quality of life is something that as a healthcare provider I'm focused on. So that's up here in the right-hand corner of this, this diagram. So if you move your eyes down the right-hand side, these are things, and granted, not everything is on this list, but loosely, these are things that we know that impact health outcomes. So from my perspective, as a healthcare provider, I'm here in this box, this clinical care box, which is estimated about 20%. I think in the community, it's actually less. Um, less than like 20% of what I do, it has less than a 20% impact on improving health outcomes. And that in this model is defined as access to care and quality of care. So I think about from the healthcare provider perspective, no wonder we're kind of banging our heads against the wall, frustrated with how come our patient, as Kim said, you know, if a patient comes into the clinic and the patient says, yes, I took my medicine, then I'm thinking, well, how come it's not, how come you're not getting better? <laughs> like, what am I doing wrong? Um, and so that, that whole concept has, has led to a philosophical shift in how um, I have approached my own healthcare practice and how we've designed our, the, at least at Rush in the College of Nursing, our Office of Faculty Practice, where we have flipped that model. So we, we, we say from the beginning, healthcare initiatives alone do not improve health outcomes. We know that. In order to get to this, you know, the upper right-hand corner of this picture here, we have to partner with other organizations, with other people who are experts in these other areas to help us improve health outcomes because we're only 20%. We can't do it alone. So I, I want to share a story. So one of our partners, so at, in our in my work, um, again, I've been doing community-based uh, uh, primary care for about 20 years. Um, one of our partners is, uh, and we have over 30 partners where we have nurses and nurse practitioners and medical students and all kinds of um, clinical people going out into the community trying to move that needle to improve health outcomes. St. Leonard's Ministries is one of our partners where we do this. And this is a picture of their courtyard. They're located, we can, I can walk there from, from the medical center here in the medical district. It's right uh, just, just on the other side of the United Center. And what St. Leonard's is, is it's a um, transitional supportive housing uh, social service organization that provides housing and a whole bunch of wraparound social services for um, individuals who recently were released from Illinois prisons. So the average length of incarceration, so there's about 42 beds for uh, male beds, and there's 22 female beds that make up this campus. And then in addition to that, we have single, uh, like single apartments for about 150 individuals. So all in on the campus, there's a two, give or take 200 or so um, residents. And in this red brick building here, we have a little clinic. 
and the clinic was um, used to be the executive director's office and we we reached out to St. Leonard's and we said, hey, you know, we'd like to partner with you to bring healthcare to the community. Because as Kim very beautifully outlined, when people come to the medical center and the campus, we can't see what's going on at home. We have no idea what the context is for the lived experience of our patients. And so again, we, it, we are flipping the model. So we're bringing healthcare to the community. So we have a little clinic here um, that's available for all of the um, uh, residents at St. Leonard's and, and their staff. So this picture here, I, I, the, the bottom right-hand picture, these are some of my students who, and this is the courtyard, and you can see they brought a whole bunch of food and spread because um, embedding ourselves in the community to become part of the community, sharing a little bit of ourselves, breaking bread together, um, not just coming in as healthcare providers to check blood pressure, um, is, a, is what we have found to be the most effective to building trust in the community. So that when I do see patients in the clinic and I say, hey, you know, you're, you have high blood pressure, we need to work on that together, then I'm a little bit of a, I'm a little step closer to um, them being ready to receive the guide, the medical guidance that I'm offering. So I'll tell a little story. Um, we, one day, so about a year into um, practicing here, you know, having clinic at the, at St. Leonard's, um, it took, it took a long time to build trust where people would actually come to the clinic. Um, so one day I was there and I actually had a really busy day. I probably had about 15 people who came into the clinic and I let, and most of the people, so we did a complete comprehensive, um, you know, physical exam, check blood pressure, you know, check meds, kind of the whole nine yards. And most of the people that I saw that day had high blood pressure and needed a treatment plan of some kind. They needed a medication adjustment or a diet adjustment or something. So I, <laughs> at the end of the day, so I went through with each patient and came up with a comprehensive plan. And I said, I would like to see you the follow next week and we're gonna check your blood pressure again and we'll see how you're doing on the treatment plan. And I left that day and I'm laughing because I left that day and I was like, yes, I am saving lives. This is what I'm here for. <laughs> I felt so good because I felt like I, I finally connected with my patients and this model that we, you know, the experiment that we're doing was finally paying off. So the following week, I'm driving to clinic and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I'm going to be so busy today because everybody's going to be coming back to see me and how am I going to manage my time? And thought, you know, I was kind of like trying to prep for the day in my head and I get there and it's crickets. Nobody comes to the clinic. It's so nine o'clock goes by, 10 o'clock rolls by, 11 o'clock. Finally, it's lunchtime. I go out to the courtyard and I see, I saw one of um, one of the residents and I said, hey, what's going on? Where is there? Is there something going on? What's going on? Where is everybody? Um, and the patient said, you know, Angela, we all talked about what happened in the clinic last week, all the patients that I had seen. And we decided that your blood pressure cup is broken. You don't know what you're talking about. And we decided that none of us have high blood pressure. Um, none of us are gonna take our meds and we're gonna start drinking apple cider vinegar because that's the home remedy, remedy right, Kim? <laughs> to you nodding. That's the home remedy that, that we trust and we are willing to accept to address our blood pressure. So for me as a provider, I was like, oh my gosh, I have completely missed something really, really big here. So, um, <laughs> so that, that's, that's what it's like to be a provider in, in, the, in community settings. You have to have an open mind and open heart to receive that feedback, as Kim said, you know, like hear the feedback. And that was, that was tough for me to hear. I have to say, I was like, wait, you don't trust me? I, 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 have, I, um, I went to a good school. I know how to take blood pressure. I was, I was like, I had to put my own ego aside and figure out like what, you know, what exactly is going on here. So the end of the story is we, I decided, okay, um, to the patient, and this is one of one of my patients here. He's he's. We did this comprehensive. It, it took about six months, but we did this comprehensive intervention where we gave blood pressure cuffs to all of the residents. So we shifted the locus of power from from us as the healthcare providers to the patients themselves. We taught them how to check their own blood pressures, gave them blood pressure logs, taught them how to you know keep track of it. Um, and then did, then we also did in the courtyard here with my students, we did kind of like a science experiment 
where we lined up, we, with permission, we, people lined up, they volunteered to be part of the science experiment and we checked blood pressures against each other. And we said, see, the blood pressure cup does work. Like this, these are, you know, like this is, this isn't faulty equipment. Um, and as a result, we have, because of this shift and comprehensive approach, we, our patients that we take care of have better high blood pressure control than we do in some of our other clinics. So that's what it's like to be a provider. I'll share one more story and then um, I'm just gonna keep an eye on time. I think I'm doing okay on time. But one other story. Um, so here in this, this, this is a map of the neighborhood. This is where St. Leonard's is located, this red star. And the blue little bubble, that's the closest Walgreens. So one of my patients, actually several of my patients. So when I first started at the clinic, I said, and remember, um, most of the patients have been incarcerated, they've been locked up for a long time. The average length of incarceration for residents at St. Leonard's is 22 and a half years. So many of the individuals have been incarcerated most of their adult lives and they get out. And it's a really critical, from a healthcare provider's perspective, the, the um, risk of mortality in that first year after getting out of prison, more than quadruples. So that's part of the reason why we chose to partner with St. Leonard's because it's a critical um, time to intervene to help people uh, make it through that time and survive, literally survive. Um, so when, um, when I first, and one of the, one of the problems and people get out of prison is they don't always have the medications that they need. Um, they're supposed to, but it doesn't always happen for a, a whole variety of reasons. That's a whole nother hour lecture, a whole variety of reasons. So they come to see me in the clinic and I say, okay, we need to, we need to get you back on this blood pressure medicine. The closest Walgreens, so I do a lot of education about how to fill a prescription, like where to go, what do you do when you go up to the, to the desk at Walgreens, what, what do you say, and how do you pay for it, and how, you know, those kinds of things, which is not typically what a provider does when you think about your typical visit at a regular doctor clinic, um, so we spent a lot of time on that, so one of the issues that I had was I uh, sent a patient down the street, it's literally two blocks away, went to go fill his prescription. The following week, I asked him, did you, have you started taking your medicine? He said, well, I went to the, I went to Walgreens. I did everything you told me to do, but they told me it wasn't ready. And so I left and I didn't get it. And a whole week had gone by and I was like, wait, what do you mean you, you left? And he's like, well, it wasn't ready. So I, I left. <laughs> so I had to say, I was like, wait a minute. But just because it wasn't ready in that moment doesn't mean it's not going to be ready in 20 minutes from now. So we had, so even the education here, I was again putting my ego aside. I thought I was doing this great job educating and share, you know, kind of helping, empowering people to take control of their own healthcare. Um, and even with um, with the perspective that I was trying to approach with, it still wasn't good enough. So uh, for this individual, for example. So, um, so that was another aha moment for me. Where I was like, hey, I need to really, I need to really think about this again. Um, the picture is over here to the right. Um, this, this is a with permission. Uh, one of my, this is one of my patients. When the pandemic hit, we had to close the clinic and we went all virtual, um, which um, you know was a challenge for all the reasons that we probably all experienced. But because I love this picture because it really illustrates how embedded we have become in the community. I get teary when I think about this, but the pandemic hit, remember in those early, early days, people didn't know what to do. We couldn't find PPE. There were no masks. There were no cleaning supplies. It was really very scary. And the St. Leonard's community, the residents at St. Leonard's banded together and started making cloth masks for our clinic staff and to give to other clinics because they felt like we were, we were, we were them. We were together. We we're in this together and they wanted to help. And so I think um, I use that as kind of like a metric, like, oh, we must, we're, we're doing something right because we feel like we're part of the community together. Um, one of the things that I think about, and I'll just talk about this quickly. You've probably seen, seen this picture before, um, equality versus equity. I think as a provider working in community clinics, my job is over here in the right. I don't know if you can see my mouse but these extra boxes for this little short guy here, that's what I do. That's my, that is my responsibility is to be those extra boxes, to go the extra mile, 
to help her. So instead of just giving a prescription to a patient and say, okay, go down to Walgreens and fill it. I'm not, I'm also saying, this is how you fill it. This is what you do if it doesn't work, et cetera, et cetera. So in like taking a step back, as I think about the work that I'm doing, you know, it's not all roses and perfect, happy endings. It is, it's challenging. And I think that that's because there are, there are some pretty major gaps in our healthcare system, the way it's designed um, for patients, there's access issues, there's payment structures that are preventing patients from being able to <clears throat> access the system that in the way that we would like them to, or we think they should, um, which leads to another problem. What I think is not necessarily what's best for the patient. So there's there's this disconnect between providers and patients. Um, oops, I, that's the third column. I'm skipping ahead. Let me go back to the providers and system. So I think as, as a provider, one of the one of the big gaps that drives me crazy. Like if I had a magic wand, I wish I had more time with my patients because that's what builds trust. Mm -hmm. um, the training for like the the training that I received as a healthcare provider doesn't necessarily match up with what I need to know in order to be an effective healthcare provider in the community. And so there's a, that is a system problem. We are not training healthcare providers in as well as we could be in issues of racism in healthcare, the social determinants of health and healthcare and how we can intervene, how we can be effective interveners. Also performance rewards. When you think about, you know, in a traditional clinic, RVUs and how, how providers are measured, and in how effective they are as a healthcare provider doesn't match up with what the, you know, the community um, needs. And then lastly, between providers and patients, there's, there's a disconnect as Kim and I have said, you know, between trusting relationships, the time that is needed to build a trusting relationship and then accountability structure. So what if there's a provider that's not doing, you know, not prescribing the right medication what accountability do, what access or what lever can patients pull to hold that provider accountable? How would they even know? Where would they go? So that's a system problem um, that I've, I'm hopeful, you know, I'm excited about this panel. So we're talking about systems design. You know, I'm excited about ways that we can hopefully address these gaps. And that is all I have. So I'll stop sharing. Thank you so much. Turn it over. Yeah. That was very interesting for us to know. Um, uh, I'll move on to Chris because we are now running a little up, up the clock. So Chris, um, I've known Chris for a few years now, and he's the director of community design at IIT Institute of Design and brings a very different perspective about how to engage with community and how to keep the work like firmly about with and for the community. So uh, Chris, over to you. Thank you. Uh, and thank you both Kim and Angela for all of your great work. I know all the designers on the call were like, they sound like designers, <laughs> which is so much of our language in, uh, in your presentation. So um, you all are probably the best community primary care designers on this call. Um, so I'll just share quickly about um, work that I've done at the Institute and with the community. And so my focus is very much around anti-racist design, which I think uh, both speakers and Senator um, Hunter spoke about. And from my perspective, this is the, the main thing we have to address if we're gonna think about new futures, equitable futures for in healthcare and energy and education, that this is a, the crux of um, inequity in, in our system. Um, and so I'm just gonna go straight to the lessons and, and interweave these into uh, the story. Um, so, quickly, right? You carry the rep reputation of your institution wherever you go, and that's good and bad. Uh, properly compensate people for their time and expertise. Emphasis on expertise, because a lot of times we don't think of these folks as experts. They're just residents or the community or some or user in our language. Um, and so we have to reframe our, our mindset on how we think about folks. Uh, engage in service, not projects. And this is very much from a design perspective, uh, leave the place better than when you got there. Um, a huge part. Um, and design is a powerful tool in the hands of residents to design anti-racist futures. And I know that sounds 
we're like, if you give them design, of course they're gonna design, but the emphasis is that they actually do the design work, not quote unquote designers. Um, and so you carry the reputation of the institution wherever you go. Uh, and this is a quote that I really appreciate uh, about Maholi Naj, who's the founder of the Institute of Design. It says, ensure society has access to the maximum use of constructive abilities for its benefit. Um, and so this sounds really great. And it, it is something that we are trying to do at the Institute of Design, but we also recognize that we are at uh, uh, an institution that has not had a great reputation um, and a great relationship with Black residents, particularly in Bronzeville. Um, and so when we go to do projects, when I've gone to do projects, I, I lived in Washington Park where a lot of the story will take place around Boxville. And when I went to do this project around 51 Futures or this, this lab uh, studio, people who I knew who were my neighbors when they saw IIT behind me, immediately started to distance themselves from me. They no longer saw me as Chris, they saw me as a representative of the institution that they did not like. Um, and so it, it was a lot of work to rebuild that relationship, even though we had a personal relationship. And so I think for all of us doing work in communities, recognizing the reputation, the history of our, our institutions with the communities, we want to engage with and hopefully serve. Um, second one is probably compensate people for their time and expertise. So we're doing this uh, studio in Bronzeville and the whole thing is how do we help people design the future of their community, right? Sounds very noble. And we're trying to engage people to, to, to work with us. And this guy had stopped me and said, no. I said, why? He said, you're getting paid for this, right? I said, yeah. He said, well, I'm not. And he left. He said, I got to go to work. And so, you know, a lot of times when we're in academic institutions, we have a luxury of uh, stopping, thinking, you know, designing uh, that people don't have. I think, Kim, you brought this point up a lot around people have lives outside of our interests. And so we have to be figuring out ways in which to compensate folks that it's worth it for them to engage with us, right? Um, third, engage in service, not projects. When we set up this studio, the original thought was there's a, a concept uh, or method called living labs and design where you set up in, in a community and you know, you're constantly studying in real time, trying to uh, change things. And so we said we were not gonna do a lab because we were not gonna study people. Uh, we did a studio and said, you come here and the studio is yours, which was really hard for us to convince people that we, were, we didn't have an agenda because we always have an agenda, right? Um, and so this was the, this is the picture of the market. The studio that we had was um, that kind of uh, magenta box on the top right. And the community decided every issue that we worked on, they synthesized all the information that we uh, collected and, and started to become the designers, the, the creators of their own future. Um, uh -oh, okay. Uh, so then leave the place better than when you got there. A key aspect of this for us, so this is a, a, a look at the methods we used during the studio. And one thing my students had to do was every method we use, they had to create an artifact that people could take with them so they could learn and utilize these methods themselves. So getting back to that original quote, how do you ensure the maximum capabilities of, of society, design tools can no longer be locked in the, in the ivory towers that they've been in for, for far too long. Um, and so, you know, how do they learn uh, sketching and, and uh, synthesis the way that we practice, not saying it's the only way, but it's a, a, a way that most residents don't have access to. Poems is a framework. So, you know, it's not just about giving them design tools. We also compensated people for their time. So we were engaging the local entrepreneurs. Uh, if people came and engaged with us at the studio, they got um, uh, not necessarily gift certificates. We had to create these like uh, uh, kind of bootleg tokens so that they could utilize them with the entrepreneurs 
in the community. So we were also um, advancing the local economy. So really focusing on black and brown entrepreneurs. Which then, this is the, the, how did Boxville improve the perception of black folks? This was the main topic people wanted to work on, which is about racism, which then led for me to think about how can design create anti-racist outcomes, which has been the focus of my work since we did this, this project. And so finally, um, again, design is a powerful tool in the hands of residents to design anti-racist futures. I don't believe that designers will fix this that it will always have to be situated in the hands of the populace to make the type of social change we want, but design can help um, bring the, the imagination and, and create the pathways for anti-racism. So this is a pop-up studio um, I led this spring with some students uh, who were awesome. And so, you know, the main thing was thinking about on the left, how do you identify racism, how it affects you and your community? Imagine what an equitable future related to that situation might look like, and then develop infrastructures to enable that future to happen. And so these were all done. There was no designer to say, this is how you do it. You're doing it wrong. Similar to what you're saying, Kim. Um, and so, you know, this is how I believe we're going to utilize design in any domain to help uh, bring about the equitable future that people need. Um, so these are my lessons from my community work. And again, thank you both uh, for, for all of your amazing work and your insights today. Thank you, Chris. Um, I think your provocation about who owns the tools and who owns the agenda is really essential to this rethinking of how we create healthcare models going forward. I'd like to bounce this over to Leanna. Uh, Leanna, take it away. All right, can you all see my screen? Thank you. Wow, wow, wow. Thank you, Kim and Angela and Chris. That was really incredible and fabulous. I am learning so much uh, myself. So I really appreciate being on a panel with you guys. And thank you, Kim and Santosh for creating this space to talk about this incredibly important topic that is, you know, near and dear to I think all of our hearts um, on the panel. Um, so uh, my name is Liana Lopez. I'm a licensed clinical social worker by trade. And prior to coming over to the healthcare world, I worked in community social service agencies in Chicago for 15 years. Um, so that's my perspective. And Angela, I actually worked very closely with St. Leonard's Ministry. I ran a health and wellness program for them. And I, I, love, I love that place. I love those gentlemen. And I, I'll tell you, I remember one day dropping off one of the residents to Cook County Hospital ER because I didn't know where else to go for his minor injury. And now I'm on the other side trying to figure out how to engage those folks in primary care. So um, you know, and we just don't know on the community side how the heck to connect. And so just, you know, really appreciate, you know, the work that Kim and, and Angela and Chris are all doing to try to connect these two entities. So um, um, I work at, with Medical Home Network. Um, where we came out of a Comer Family Foundation investment to help transform the safety net back about 10 years ago and um, connect all these disparate entities, right? So social service agencies, the health, you know, primary care, um, hospitals, um, community mental health, connect them all in meaningful ways uh, because everything is so disparate. And I think uh, Senator Hunter brought up this first statistic um, that is just completely appalling, right? That, you know, folks downtown are having 16 year life expectancy higher than somebody um, living over by where St. Leonard's Ministries is. So it's it's heartbreaking. Um, and um, it is our, our, our call to work on, on fixing this. So about 10 years ago, uh, Medical Home Network created MHN ACO. It's an accountable care organization and uh, Rush Medical Group and Sinai Medical Group are a part of our ACO. Um, the most of our partners are federally qualified health centers in the community. Um, so we have a really great um, reach in Chicago Cook County. We serve about 165,000 patients with uh, care management, or what I call, you know, in the community we call it case management, um, from the from out of the FQHC. So our model is to embed nurses and social workers and community health workers into the community health centers 
right, in the primary care setting to give uh, the providers more reach um, and more ways to engage patients in their community. So uh, when Angela was talking about the, the frustration of a PC of a provider to only have those very short interventions with their patients um, and not really be able to extend the reach, you know, our community health workers um, learning from people like Kim, Ms. J, uh, learn to go in the community and really um, extend the reach of the PCP and kind of preach the PCP model, right? Like, come on, it's not that bad. We'll, we'll, we'll make it better. You can always call me um, and make it more approachable. So um, you all know about social determinants of health. It's the uh, conditions and environments that, we're, that people are born, live, work, play, et cetera. Um, that are all affecting our health care. And so MHN, like everyone else, is um, trying to figure out how we can address those social needs along with the medical and the behavioral. Um, and one thing we do is um, part of our model is to outreach patients with a, a health risk screening, which is our very first screening for patients. It takes just a few minutes, um, but it has, it asks about, you know, chronic conditions, about their uh, behavioral any um, you know, mental health or substance use. And it also asks about those social factors that are impacting their care. Um, and we've had really great success. We've completed over 300,000 of them for patients within the community. And um, it, it, it marks that we're finding these patients who maybe haven't previously engaged in primary care before and trying to pull them into the health center. Um, and uh, of those uh, different uh, social factors that we screen for with the health risk screening, uh, we, we've been able to um, show a 37.4 reduction in those social determinants of health. So we're talking about things like needing housing, needing food, um, having you know essential items for the home, uh, have trouble paying for medications, needing transportation. So our job is really to try to figure out how as a health center, our staff can help um, engage people meaningfully in um, reducing those social factors. So I'm just gonna briefly talk about three different initiatives we have going right now um, uh, as an ACO at the different health centers. I'm gonna keep it real brief and anybody can always reach out to me after the presentation if you wanna talk more. So one is investing in housing. Um, I come from the housing world, it's a passion of mine. Um, people can't get better if they don't have a place um, that to rest their head, to rest, to store their insulin, to. Um, take their water pill and have a, a restroom to use consistently. So um, we are investing in permanent supportive housing uh, because of the crises in Chicago with, with uh, affordable housing. Um, and our patients, uh, once selected, um, are put up in uh, permanent housing and given tenancy support. So, um, you know, um, an understanding independent living skills, um, help finding jobs and that sort of thing. Uh, the second initiative we have going that uh, I'm also is near and dear to my heart because I am a, a mental health provider um, is our collaborative care model for depression management that we, we embed into primary care. So um, we help our, um, we have over, well over 100 clinic sites across Chicago, but um, we help finance putting um, a kind of like a community health worker, a bachelor's level mental health provider into the clinic that can help follow patients in between their PCP visits, make sure they're adhering to medications from a non-provider perspective, right? Just checking in on, uh, you know, are, are, are you having any side effects from your antidepressant you're taking? Um, and doing really simple coaching and support to patients, meeting them in the community if needed, um, and coordinating care, and then offering kind of this psychiatry consult piece as well to providers to teach them how to manage medications because um, our providers also need support. <laughs> Um, and it really lowers the stigma, right, um, of mental health, which is a, a big challenge for our communities that we serve. Um, and it's more like a peer-to-peer -peer coaching model where, um, where uh, patients can talk about their emotions and stress without having to talk about, you know, some mental health diagnoses or, you know, some of the stigma um, that comes along with that. Um, and we've had great outcomes, really, really wonderful outcomes and see, see real reductions in, in um, in tangible reductions in depression symptoms. And then the last thing real quick, um, we have a medical legal partnership and I'll say um, from someone at, who has worked on the community side, um, sometimes in the healthcare world, one of my frustrations is we say, oh, we want to address social determinants of health. What we need to do is connect with the social service agency. They're gonna, they're gonna give us what we need. The thing is the social service agencies, they're strapped. 
they have very few resources. And if we refer that out, we lose we lose sight of um, kind of uh, knowing what's what's going to happen to our patients. And so I just want to say, you know, we really need to think in the healthcare world about tangibly meeting the needs of our communities who are incredibly underserved um, and looking at how we can be innovative um, with actually providing real tangible resources um, to meet the needs that they're experiencing in their every day. No one can focus on their diabetic or asthmatic state if they um, you know, are completely unsafe, feel completely unsafe in their community, or um, they don't have uh, enough food on their table. Um, but the last uh, initiative real quick is our medical legal partnership. So we partner with the Legal Council for Health Justice. Um, and so we are able to um, provide our patients, you know, that present in the clinics with um, uh, legal resources um, to help them where they're at and connect them with an actual lawyer who can, who can support them. And these medical legal partnerships can be really fruitful and you know, help patients navigate the incredibly complicated paperwork of trying to you know, set up WIC or, or SNAP or um, um, other needs that patients have. So um, with that, I will um, pass it back over to Kim and Santosh. Thank you so much, Liana. That was amazing. And wow, such an amazing summary, insight, and just the, the knowledge that each one of you have shared as a panelist is mind-bogglingly huge to me. So uh, I want to move the discussion to a quick round of discussions. And uh, um, without further ado, I would like to say uh, we will have a round of discussion on equitable primary care and longevity of solutions. Uh, Kim, uh, do you want to take the first question? Yeah, I'm really provoked uh, by Angela's statement at the end of her presentation, which is, if I could change one thing, I would ask for more time with my patients. I would like to ask that of the rest of the panelists, and Leanna, since you um, you actually gave us some good news, I would like to go to you directly and start with you. If you could change one thing about um, healthcare to make it better fit community needs, what would you pick? Oh man, just one, Kim. <laughs> um, uh, this kind, I'm gonna, you know, the Chris's presentation was really phenomenal for me, and I think if I could change one thing, it would be that we could really truly adopt um, trauma informed care as our model in institutions that addresses, um, you know, the systemic racism and all of the other factors that our patients have experienced. Um, and that we can, um, you know, the work that Kim, uh, Kim is doing, doing, Angela doing are all part of the solutions and Chris, um, but trauma-informed care is really um, a beautiful way. Um, we got to establish safety with our patients. We need to, um, I think Kim said, trust is critical, right? We have to build trust, um, provide choices for patients um, and really engage them in a collaborative uh, work that can empower them um, in their own healthcare. Thank you. And Chris, over to you. Do you have a point of view about the one thing you would change? Uh, yeah, my whole presentation, racism. I think that that's the one. And it's not the only one. Uh, I, I'm, I think a lot about um, sexism in, in healthcare and, you know, with uh, Black maternal deaths, uh, Black women especially not being listened to during pregnancies and post and after delivery, that that is a it's not that there's a external condition making them die. It's literally sexism and racism overlapping that that causes these deaths. And so, you know, these these two oppressions I think are just essential to be addressed if we are actually going to move uh, the healthcare needle. Yeah, I, I'd like to really add to that. Um, some of you have heard I quote Fernando de Mayo at the American Medical Association frequently. He really urges us to stop looking at characteristics of the patients. Stop looking at their race, stop looking at their sex, stop looking at their age, and start looking at characteristics of the system, the racism, the patriarchy. These are the things that uh, I, I think that as designers, we orient to, we don't blame our, our users. Um, we ask, how could we optimize the system so that they could actually be more successful? This is how um, commercial industry works in the rest of the world. Somehow it's not working this way in healthcare, one of our most important domains. Uh, Kim, I was wondering if you wanted to give us an answer as well as to what, if you could change one thing, what would you change? Well, Chris stole my one thing. However, however, when I think about the one thing that 
would make a difference to me from my perspective is about cultural humility and about it being a part of the process of onboarding new healthcare uh, physicians or healthcare providers. I think that they're, they're taught in school, you know, a certain code, a certain ethic, but the important piece that's missing is the human experience in the process. And it needs to be embedded in how people are educated and how they are onboarded into this field. And to me, that will that could address some of the racism and that could address some of some of the stigma that's attached to healthcare. And it's sad to say that you, you know, again, it's not every every physician or every healthcare provider, but it's too many uh on the opposite side that makes it a challenge. So if, if I could change one thing, it would be the education process of uh, onboarding our healthcare professionals with including and embedding in the curriculum that that culture humility piece and, and, and that uh, boots on the ground perspective so they really get it uh, from the very beginning without all of that shroud of <laughs> historical mumbo jumbo. That's what I'm going to <laughs> Yeah, I, I think that, you know, Angela also highlighted the, the, the gap between how we are educating our providers and what they're actually asked to do and what they need to do. Um, so I think that there's a, a lot of root cause um, orientation around education as maybe something that needs updating. I, I, and I actually was really struck by how Angela has allowed herself to be uh, have a second wave of education um, through her primary care services. Uh, so maybe it's a continual process of education we should also be thinking about. Mm -hmm. Kim, is it, would it be all right if I just add one tiny caveat to the time, please? Yeah, please. Yeah, I know. Okay, so what I what I I want to expand on time. So yes, I I wish I my magic wand would fix the time issue, but I think. From a system perspective, part of the issue with not with providers and patients not having enough time together has to do with the reimbursement mechanisms. So we are like, and so I guess Senator Hunter, I'm looking to you to to help us fix this issue with legislation for Medicaid and Medicare reimbursement for community-based interventions that we know work, so that we're not. Um, reliant upon, you know, soft dollars or philanthropic dollars, but that there's a sustainability plan to support us providing more time and services in the community. So that's, thank you for letting me <laughs> expand on that. Well, I, I had noticed that nobody raised up uh, payment as an issue for change. Payment is an issue. Yeah. Okay. yeah. We all know money is running the show in the yeah. end. Um, this is a, a, a disturbing discovery for me. <laughs> Uh, Santosh, did you want to add to that? Yeah, no, when you said money, I was just going to say that in the chat, everybody's referring to Chris Kennedy's uh, uh, message there. So the Dean of College of Nursing has just mentioned about money, Kim. <laughs> the, the moment you said it. <laughs> yeah, I see it now. <laughs> yep. So everybody's on the wall here. And, and it's true, right? Like as systems designers, like we are one of the few actually uh, that uh, bring everybody to the table and build like a huge... Uh, bridge across these different domains and different peoples with different expertises. Yeah, back to you, Kim. Well, I think we only have about 15 minutes left. Um, and so I had a question, another round robin for the panel, which is if there are, do you have one or two principles that you would like to see designers and stakeholders attending this summit uh, use when they are starting to rethink primary care? And I am going to, let's see, where should we start? I'll start with you, Angela. Gosh, um, so I think, so the, the question is, what would, do, what do I want designers to know? What kind of advice would you have or principles for designing primary care that we could use going forward? Yeah, I think, um, basically, so in a nutshell, and there's, you could break this down in many different ways. But I think um, it needs to be um, totally disrupted at every step. So when you're thinking about primary, it should look different. It should feel that the experience should be different. It should happen in different places. Your providers need to be educated differently. Like the whole thing needs to kind of be blown up a little bit. 
<laughs> and and redone um, and using like as Chris mentioned, you know, addressing seriously addressing racism, having people who are going to be the the users of the services design what what it is. I mean, like that story that I said at St. Leonard, you know, I thought I was doing this great job managing blood pressure. I totally missed the point. So um, being at, because we were embedded in that location, I had the, the freedom to redesign how we were addressing blood pressure in that, in that space. But that's not true for most primary care clinics. So like most primary care clinics don't have the freedom to, to you know, flip the model in that way. That makes sense. That makes complete sense. And I, I agree with you. I love the idea that users should be designing the next practice level model. And it should yeah. look and feel different. It should just, it has to be visibly different, not just subtly different. Right. Um, Leanna, do you have advice for stakeholders on this call for how to redesign healthcare? Well, I, uh, I probably, I just want to echo Angela and say the whole model needs to be blown up. <laughs> I mean, it's, there's, there's just so many, so many ways. I mean, we're all trying to figure out how to scrape dollars together to show, to prove that this initiative works, right? Or that this, in these tiny little microcosm, little ecosystems. And the truth is that, you know, in order to really impact care, we got to think about models that we can, ex that can expand across. And that means changing payment structures and um, going to patients and seeing where they're at um, to, you know, in Ms. J, Ms. J's, um, work that she does. Um, but I do want to add one quick thing on payment. I mean, this is something I talk about money all day, every day, because I'm an account, I work for an accountable care organization. And the money that we save goes back into our health center's pockets. And so we are really adamant about creating value-based payment models um, and structures um, for, that's our whole world. We're one of the only su successful Medicaid accountable care organizations. Um, you know, I sit around all day and try to think about how to engage a patient who's chronically homeless and has mental health issues and chronic conditions and goes to the emergency room for primary care and um, and how we can engage them in uh, in, in uh, with their PCP and with their their team at their medical home that's what I do all day every day um, I have to say value-based payment models are amazing and it's just like moving upstream at every single level of the system. Um, and so we do need, we, we need, we need these models to be created at higher, higher structures so that we can, we can make some more sustainable change. Fantastic. I feel like there's a whole uh, webinar to be done on what becomes different under a value-based model, because I think that that hasn't been robustly explored. I agree with you. Uh, Chris, advice. Oh, I don't know about advice. Um, I was hearing hearing all the stuff around economics. I mean, that's like my world. Um, but I think it's looking beyond just the primary care economics. Uh, so like, what if primary care was also just focusing on preventative health? So, you know, how access to food, right? Most communities, community I live in, the nearest uh, grocery store is like two miles away. Um, so like, how do you, that preventative piece uh so that they're not relying upon like the emergency room or like you know the better health outcomes uh thinking about primary care or the health care's industry's relationship to the industrial indus uh sector right so most of these communities most black and brown communities are within earshot of some toxic factory i don't care how much primary care you're doing as long as there's a coal plant two blocks away they're going to have these chronic health issues, right? Uh, I look at the Southeast side as a prime example. And so the interconnectivity of, of these issues and, and how does the healthcare system um, begin advocating or, or strong, stronger advocation? Av anyway, you know what I'm saying? Uh, yeah. I could not agree with you more. I think we need some form of cross-sector accounting such that we are not just looking at the dollars that we're investing in healthcare. We are looking at the whole flow of money through these other sectors because we have wrong pocket problems, right? You invest uh, money into um, a healthcare intervention, but it's actually 
uh, you know, some other sector that benefits from that investment and vice versa. So I think that there is some, some larger cross-sector effort that needs to be, needs to tie these different spheres, which frankly, people don't live in verticals, right? We don't just live in a healthcare vertical. We don't just live in an economic vertical. Um, we have to find ways to pull these together. Santosh, I'm gonna turn this over to you. Um, we don't have that much more time left. Yeah. Wanna... I was actually going to throw it to uh, uh, Senator Hunter. I, uh, any, anything you wanted to add about that? Because I saw your comment in the chat, so I wanted to make sure you got a chance to. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, for the record, I'd like to say that I'm very impressed with what you guys are doing here today. I mean, you, you all just cannot imagine how enthused I am to the point where I'm still on this 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 uh, this Zoom meeting, you know. And so uh, uh, the Black Caucus, we put together the House. Uh, what is it, House Bill 158, which is our Health and Human Services pillar. And what Representative Camille Lilly, who was the House sponsor, has been doing is going around meeting with different groups such as yourself and speaking to yourself. So after, after this one, I have another one today. And, and I meet with groups um, from various sectors. Mm -hmm. uh, next, we'll be working, like this afternoon, no, at 10 o'clock, I'm meeting with the uh, FQAC heads. Okay, and then I was talking to Camille's representative Lily last night, and I said that our next meeting should be with um, the hospital presidents. You know, because see, you all are talking about structural change, implicit bias, funding. We've also uh, are meeting with uh, the governor's head people, his deputy governor that's over health and human services and all of their department heads, the people that are over the Medicaid program, you all are talking about funding issues. Uh, you all are talking about all kinds of gaps in services, you know? And so the governor's office, they're the ones that implement, we set policy in the legislature. The governor's um, job and his, and, his, and his department heads are to implement it. So that's where we are now with the, the, uh, the Black Caucus uh, health and human services pillar, but we have four pillars. One is economic, another in inequities, uh, education inequity, and another is, and the other is criminal justice reform. And so for persons such as yourself who have a vision, it's all connected. Mm -hmm. Everything is connected, you know? And so there's that, I mean, all of these silos that has been existing all of the, all of these years, they have, they have created the condition that we have today. And it's time to stop it. And so I would like for you all to invite myself and Representative Lilly to come and sit down with you all when you all are ready to sit down with us so that we can help design a system. We have different, we created under our uh, uh, House Bill 158, a number of commissions and advisory boards that we are gonna ask some of you all to sit on because we need your expertise. We do not have all of the answers, okay? And so, um, Let's talk. <laughs> Let's Thank talk. you, Senator. Thank you. Thank so you, much. guys. Thank you so much. Because uh, yeah, and and I work in the provost office on the university strategy, so the provost, the president, they would be really willing to address this with you directly. Sure. So, yeah, this is something. Mm -hmm. As as I'm hearing the comments in the chat, it's this is ongoing work, and we definitely have to partner on this to have a real impact in the real world. So, thank you so much for those comments. Thank uh, you. Kim, can you bring up that resource page just once and then yeah. and I'll hand it over back to you to close out. We are at 9.24. Oh, all good. This is like one of the best sessions I have been honored to host. So this is really awesome. Um, so uh, if anybody has any um, like um, need for some like data where we come from or to understand what's going on in Chicago. so. These are some of the resources like the Rush Community Health Needs Assessment that we publish, the State of Black Health in Chicago. It's a report from uh, CDPH, uh, the Transformation Report um, from the State of Illinois, the cha Challenging Future of the Chicago Safety Net, and Unequal Cities uh, by uh, uh, Dr. Benjamin and Dr. DeMaio. So please check out these resources. They're amazing. And, and all the conversation that is happening here is in context of all this um, resources uh, that we are thinking of and working off of. Um, and I really, uh, just from my side, thank you so much, uh, each and every one of you um, for being here and uh, being part of our panel. Kim, uh, back to you to close out our session of the day. Thank you.
Yes, I just want to point out, with the exception of unequal cities, all of these resources are free and on the internet. Um, and uh, I use them in my thinking uh, with this work and the Santosh all the time. So that's why they're on here. I'm not profiting from anything on here. I did want to thank all of our sponsors and colleagues at Rush University and the IIT Institute of Design, uh, particularly Dr. Andrew Bean, who is uh, Dean of the Rush Graduate College, and Dennis Weil, who is his counterpart at IIT, Dean of Illinois Tech's Institute of Design. Special thanks to Carol Siegel. Uh, whose generous funding of our initiative, um, just so you are aware of that, has made this event and this collaboration possible between IIT and Rush. Uh, also to President Shireen Gabriel of Rush University and Provost Sue Freeman for their generous support. Uh, we are able to have Santosh's time because of them. To Carlos Tercera, he is Director of the Institute of Design's Action Lab and is um, creating space for this kind of work to happen. Kristen Gekin and Rashan for actually helping promote the specific event and, and helping us get the technology right. Uh, and to Polly Tita and Ryan uh, Nigdaman at Rush for promoting and supporting our collaboration. And of course, State Senator Maddie Hunter um, and our distinguished panelists for their time and expertise. Uh, you have not heard the last of us. We now have your email addresses. There's more coming. <laughs> Thank you, everyone.